Uh, in a market economy, there's no correlation between subjective merit or needs and rewards. Uh, there is no fairness of results, but there should be what we call fairness of rules when you have the rule of law. Everybody has to follow the same rules to therefore uh, have equal, uh, equal liberty. Uh, he also adds the interesting point, an optimal policy may aim and ought to aim at increasing the chances of any member of society taken at random, which uh, gives a sort of moderate reason uh, for measures that might uh, increase equality of opportunity beyond the merely sort of formal uh, method. Uh, now, again, here's where he differs, of course, from the neoclassical view. Uh, such a principle of like, equal opportunity uh, does not presuppose perfect competition. It's actually one of the differences between Hayek and Popper. Popper seems to be more inclined to see perfect competition as a useful model, and he also has nice things to say about mathematical economics that uh, uh, Hayek did not. Uh, rather than perfect competition requires only no obstacles to the entry into each trade and the market functions adequately in spreading information, not taking on already perfect information. Hayek adds, and this is an extremely important part of his liberal utopia, this modest and achievable goal has never yet been fully achieved because at all times and everywhere, and I emphasize this, what follows, Governments have both restricted access to some occupations and tolerated persons and organizations deterring others from entering occupations when this would have been to the advantage of the latter. Uh, this is emphasized by the author, me, uh, to show Hayek's radical egalitarianism in contrast to the stereotypes of those on the left, especially to those dedicated to status solutions to problems where often the state is the problem and not the solution. Uh, now, uh, you know, I'm going to skip down because, yes, I want to move on to the next part soon. Uh, but what I was going to say is uh, a libertarian would say, well, if the state's problem, why not get rid of the welfare state uh, while you're at it? But I want to finish uh, this section with I exclaim there is only individual justice but no social justice. He also then discusses issues what to do with monopoly and competition, union restraint of competition, and uh, concludes the chapter with the following. The basic principles of liberal society may be summed up by saying that in such a society, all coercive functions of government must be guided by the overruling prime importance of what I like to call the three great negatives, peace, justice, and liberty. Well, that's in John Lennon, too, with a slightly different view of how to get that. This entails that government coercion is confined to enforcing only prohibitions that can be equally applied to all, and the same equality of laws applies to its positive functions, the sort of welfare education, etc., uh, that they can exact under the same uniform rules a share of the cost of the non-coercive services it may render uh, to citizens with material and personal means uh, placed at its uh, disposal. Uh, earlier, Hayek defined utopian when, in the sense that he disagreed with utopian. Uh, from his This is his 1933 paper, Trend of Economic Thinking, Proposals for the improvement of undesirable effects of the existing system based on a complete disregard of those forces which actually enabled it to work. Now, if we delete the second part of this definition, we can define a liberal utopia as one that defines the key problem as, quote, the improvement of undesirable effects of the existing system, which are primarily due to the unintended consequences of government policies, rather than being intrinsic to free market capitalism, which I think is what you were saying last night about financial markets. Hayek applies it to the whole, uh, the whole system. Okay, that takes care of uh, the hayek popper paradox. And as I said, a lot more about Hayek than Popper, but we have a question period. There's a lot of things I can't say that I don't have time to say, but I'm looking forward, and I'm definitely, would I have 10 minutes? Good.
Thank you. That's the, pretty much what I think I need. All right. Uh, now, what I'm going to do now is quote from my epilogue, which has the title, Marx, McIntyre, Modernity, and the Lenin-Lenin Dilemma. And I'm going to begin by defining uh, what I mean by Lenin-Lenin Dilemma. 1975, John Lennon sang his beautiful song, Imagine Another Anarchist Dream of a Utopia Without Government, Religion, Borders, Property, Greed, and War. Unlike Vladimir Lenin, John Lennon had no political party, secret police, army, or other means of implementing this dream. Now, interesting, 1975 was the year the Khmer Rouge decided to begin their own egalitarian utopia in Cambodia with extremely authoritarian measures, not being as naive as either the Lenin of 1917, and I have his state in revolution, an extremely utopian idea of how the revolution would take place and the state would soon wither away and we wouldn't need bureaucracy. Once Lenin got in power, he forgot all that romantic nonsense, of course. Uh, but the Khmer Rouge are not as naive as the Lenin of 1917 or the John Lennon of 1975. So here's what I pose as the dilemma. How do we bring about a utopia, whether it's libertarian, as uh, you know, quite a number of the Austrians want to do, egalitarian, or both, which is John Lennon's view. We can choose Vladimir Lenin's method of coercion and therefore totally compromise the ideals of egalitarianism, or we can choose John Lennon's more peaceful, purely persuasive methods and sacrifice any reasonable hope of ever realizing the utopia. To this day, no one has successfully solved this, including, of course, all the social democratic parties in Europe and everywhere else, because when you aim to do it democratically, you get a total compromise of our present mixed uh, or mixed-up economy, as some people might prefer to put it.